What's going on, everyone? I'm Demetrios Brinkman, the host of Are You A Robot podcast and videocast. And I just wanted to jump in real fast before we get into this episode of our videocast. I want to let you know what this series is all about. We're trying to tackle some of the greatest challenges and questions that stem from AI and related technologies. We're bringing on some of the best minds in the business around AI ethics and AI governance so they can talk to us about what is happening in their respective fields. The whole point of that is so that we can create best practices and our community can have something to contemplate as we move forward and AI continues to become more and more of an important part of our lives. If that at all resonates with you, I encourage you, I implore you to jump into our Slack community where we continue the conversation on a daily basis around these topics. The last thing I got to say is a big thank you to our sponsor. We've got one hell of a sponsor behind us, Ethics Grade. Check them out. The link is in the description. They are an ESG benchmarking firm that specializes in technological governance, very aligned with what we're trying to do here. And I want to just give them a big thanks because they are helping drive this conversation and move it forward as we are inviting on some of these top minds. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Today's guest is none other than Robbie Stamp, who you may have heard of for his work in A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He was one of the producers of that film, and he was also a close friend of the late, great Douglas Adams, who wrote that book and screenplay. Robbie is a beast in his own right, though. Don't let that fool you. He is the CEO of a company called Bios. He's also given talks in front of the UK Parliament on these topics of AI. And as the future starts to become more of the present, he just creates some spectacular thought experiments around that. And I think that was the most impacting part of the talk today with him is really examining these thought experiments and examining how I feel about it now and why I feel that way as he looks at, well, this could be a potential future for us. What are we going to do about it? It really begs the questions, yeah, how do I feel about that? What are my thoughts? What's my stance? So it's great to look at these things before they start, before they become a reality, and it's too late. Without further ado, let's jump into it with Robbie. Stamp. Are you a robot? I am thrilled and honored to be talking to you, Robbie. I know you do a lot around AI and ethics and governance. I want to just give you a quick intro and then let you talk a little bit more about what you're doing. Um, for all those that don't know who Robbie is, he has a company, it's BIOS. And they are doing incredible things in the corporate governance um, space. We also, I want to mention also that Ravi is, has been in front of parliament to talk about this ethics and the whole idea of um, where we're going as a society, I think, and the abilities and the responsibilities that we have and that the corporate businesses have as we move forward. When we spoke before, it was obvious to me that you're a deep thinker on all things that are future. But what really amazed me was how you brought the past and our human conditions and our human kind of mythology into what you see us moving towards as we go forwards. But before we get into any of that, maybe, Ravi, can you just give us a bit of background on what you're doing right now and uh, how it relates to the data ethics and AI governance space? 
I shall try. Well, thank you very much, Lee Dimitros, and, and thank you for the kind introduction, and, and thank you very much for having me. It's uh, it's really fun to be here, and it's kind of like we're doing this um, sort of feels like back at school, early September, yeah. and it feels like the new term has begun. Um, <laughs> So goodness, where, where, where to start? I mean, I suppose that, that if I start with the BIOS piece, BIOS International, um, it's a network uh, consultancy. Uh, we've got partners all over the world. Uh, it was, uh, my mother was very, very instrumental in its creation and formation and development. Uh, my mother incidentally still works full time. Um, I know people might look at me and think, my God, how, what kind of a man are you? You keeping your mother at work. But I would just hasten to say um, uh, she was only 20 when I was born <laughs> and uh, I'm coming up to being 60 shortly at the end of this month. So she's a, a very, very fit and healthy woman in her in her 80s. And she is a remarkable woman whose life's work, I suppose, has been thinking about the nature of human judgment and decision making in complex environments how was embodied human selves and the teams the organizations the institutions the societies we work in how do we as individuals and collectively respond act in be with complexity and uncertainty mm. and i think that 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 deep fascination with what is the nature of human judgment in the face of uncertainty would probably be one of the the core themes um, that sits at the heart of BIOS as we help organizations to think about the conditions they create for wise judgment and decision-making in the organization or not. Uh, and obviously, particularly now, as everybody uh, is thinking about complexity and uncertainty, what that means and feels like. And it's that space about thinking about human judgment and decision-making that has led me to exploring what that means for our relationship with AI and with data, what happens when you drop artificial intelligence systems into the complex adaptive systems we already have, we already subsist in. Yes. So one thing that really I enjoyed the last time we spoke is your notion of the shaman and how that works out when, and then how you related it back to data and our data selves. Can you go into that a little bit and maybe we can recreate some of that magic we had? <laughs> well, this is great. So bear with me. <laughs> so, because it's going to sound a slightly abstruse place to start. Um, when one thinks about other ways of seeing and being in the world, older ways of seeing and thinking about being in the world, indigenous knowledge and wisdom. Um, one of the oldest tropes in shamanic storytelling is the idea that a shaman becomes powerful when they have in the spirit world been ritually dismembered mm. and they are then put back together again. And in the new wholeness, they become a very powerful shaman. So, um, you can go back and look at the the one of the oldest myth cycles in the world, which is an Egyptian uh, myth cycle, the Osiris Isis Set myth cycle, performed in mystery plays in Thebes in three thousand BC, and it's a story about a jealous brother Set chopping his brother uh, Osiris up into pieces, distributing those pieces around Upper Egypt. Here, Osiris's wife consort Isis finding them all of them, except one rather important piece for a man, which he didn't find. Um, re, uh, Osiris is re reassembled and becomes this very powerful god of the underworld, chthonic god. Now, you can spool forward through any number of, of, of stories, but let's go to Harry Potter. Hmm. Harry Potter is a story about a light and a dark shaman duking it out over the dismembered, elements of, of 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 Voldemort. You know, can Voldemort reassemble himself before Harry Potter, the light shaman, is and can he stop him before he becomes unstoppable because he's reassembled himself? So these story tropes are very, very ancient. So just have that in mind, mm -hmm. that idea of shamanic dismemberment. And this is a big jump. So a few weeks ago I was asked by my bank to be in touch with them because they wanted to use two-factor authentication on my car, good idea. So I call them and I'm through security remarkably fast. Uh, 
kind of like what's your date of birth and what's your address and i you know as you're used now to having you know to remember the 85th word of the you know the the string of letters and who was your first pet and teacher and what teacher did they did they like tea or coffee and what an endless series of questions totally. um i remarked this was very quick and they said yes no we recognize your voice sir so i'm going to put informed consent to one side that we might want to come back to it because it's yeah. an interesting question that those messages we've all listened to in these contexts of this call may be recorded for training purposes i'm not sure i'd ever thought that was going to mean this call may be used to train an artificial intelligence to yeah. recognize your voice but let's put informed consent to one side for a second what it struck me was that that this bank now knows me in a very profound way there is now an ontology there's a, a a knowing of me in data space but that i am shamanically dismembered in data space this this comforting notion of there being a digital twin of us there's nothing like a digital twin in a sense that there's my an embodied twin of me that i am dismembered to the the four digital winds that, that I don't know where that essence of knowing of me is held. Mm. You know, is it on a ser in a server in Iceland somewhere? Is it? And of course, that that particular knowing that the bank has is replicated by lots and lots of other forms of knowing. Whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, whether it's banks, whether it's insurance companies, mm. whether it's any number of of organisations and people that are looking at those digital trails. So you can look at that very ancient way of thinking about self and dismemberment and you can think about that actually genuinely having an instantiation in these new data spaces and landscapes well that's what i found so fascinating was our data right now is so fragmented and there are so many different entities with so much data on us and we don't have anywhere that we can put it all back together and gain our power per se, like in, in the mythology that you speak of, or these stories, it's like, where can we go for this one centralized place that we say, all right, I want to know all of the data that everyone has on me and what they're doing with it. Because that's another important part of it, right? Like, like you mentioned, Hey, is this, call going to be recorded to train a voice recognition software so that it makes my life easier when I'm trying to check for fraud on my bank account? Or is this data going to be sold to a third party so that I can stay longer on a video game? What are they doing with this data and where are they getting it? What is happening? There's no centralized location. So I think that is something really interesting when I start to look at that and I start to see the um, the bigger picture of it and how we would potentially be more powerful and more empowered by knowing that kind of information. Yes. I mean, that's, it, it, it's such a, you know, there's the parts of me where I think we'll kind of, if you feel like <laughs> to use other ancient storytelling, so that genie is so out of the bottle mm -hmm. <laughs> that the, 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 but if one thinks about what might it mean to, be reassembled in data space yeah what might that mean what does it mean in terms of power and agency um i think we are all exploring what that means because if you like there's a we can think about our embodied selves so you're in my bodies occupying the physical space that you're occupying you with your lovely guitars which would, would would indicate to me obviously that you're a musician mm -hmm. and all of that means for you and what it means and the people you've played for and the people you love who love you and know you your embodied self you're standing there you're feeling maybe you're feeling breeze on your face everything that that gives you your your essence of feeling your demetrios mm -hmm. Then there's what I call, what I, well, not I call, I mean, you know, I, I think of as our dream time selves. That's the more mysterious part of ourselves, the selves in our dreams, in those liminal moments of waking and sleeping, maybe those strange coincidences that have occurred to us, those other ways of seeing and being in the world, which also maybe have some very ancient echoes about other ways of being in the world. And then there's our data self. Mm. And the fact that there is an essence of Robbie, a Robbie-ness 
in data space relating to his voice, my voice. Is it, is it, and as we think about the way these three selves, these three ontologies are going to interact with each other now and into the future, um, and the, the, where does the power over that sit? Who has power over our data? Where does the agency sit? How much agency? What do we own? What, 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 what of our data do we own? Are, are even concepts of ownership appropriate for thinking about data space? Can we take? language which is about property and land and put it originally and put it into data space yeah these are all fascinating questions which everybody's grappling with and i'm grappling with. i don't have any answers mm. but i i'm raising them and i think the idea maybe we would one day have some form of guardian ai which was ours which was able to come back and say well here's what's known about you but there could be a dark side to that as well because you could say well, actually, I want to be known differently. So is the AI purely a reporting mechanism mm -hmm. or would itself have its own agency? Does it go out and scrub or change or shift something on a site? Or, mm -hmm. you know, does it lie about you? You're a criminal using it, you're using it for nefarious purposes. And like all of these things, like anything, you, you, you're you in this constant Manichaean struggle between things that, that maximize the constructive aspects of humans, the us at our best, and the destructive side. And that, that battle, that struggle will always be there. And I guess what we're all trying to do here in these kind of conversations is just try and nudge that dial yeah. so that we're doing these things so that we're trying to maximize the constructive and minimize the destructive. Yeah, well, I think this notion of a guardian AI is brilliant and having it be like something that lets us know like you said maybe it's just notifying us or maybe it's allowing us to give consent like now i know people aren't so happy with this especially in europe when you go to any web page and you have to say all right cookies whatever and you end up clicking okay most of the time just mindlessly saying yes take them all whatever it doesn't matter to me because it's a bit of a nuisance but maybe there could be something like that with our data and and these companies are telling us in a more upfront and transparent way we're collecting this data so that we can you know have voice recognition software with it or that we can train um this machine learning model for this and so we can give the permission to say yes, I'm okay with that, or no, I'm not. And we don't have to get into any part of, oh, I, I don't like how you're presenting me, or there's mm -hmm. none of the like real personalized part of, hey, I want to change it. I want to be known in a different way. It's more just, I'm okay with you using it. I consent to you using this data for that reason, or I don't. Yeah, I think I think well, we we, we talked earlier in my my experience when I made that call, um, and we said we'd come back to informed mm -hmm. consent, and we're back to informed consent yeah. because what does informed consent in the stacked up network of contracts? And as you say, to participate in an awful lot of things, you have to give your consent. You, the system won't work. The new update won't work. The new, yeah. you know, you, 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 if you're using some kind of sensors in your home and you go, no, 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 I don't consent to that. Well, they say, well, knock yourself out then. The carbon, the carbon monoxide sensors aren't going to work. Or your, car, so, or your garage you door is not going to open. That's right. Your garage door is not so, so the whole notion of informed consent I think is a deeply problematic one. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I, um, I have a friend who, who is very senior at a, a very brilliant person at a, one of the large insurance companies, and they were starting a new job uh, in this AI data space. And I said, I would just put one kind of like phrase up on my wall that I would think about every single day, and that's informed consent. Mm. Uh, what 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 does it look like in this space? And something which allows you to reassemble yourself, understand what is known about you in data space, 
and then you know that that whole notion of what it is to be known an epistemology in this space so if you think about what it means to to know and to be known again we think about our personal lives we have our our friends partners um children colleagues who would say know us so you know they they know that if you're tired or upset maybe you've got a little tail you rub your eye or there's a tone of voice or you know uh, people could there's a brilliant description in a brilliant novel called Life and Fate by Vasily Grossman mm. of how a, 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 a wife could understand the mood her husband was in just by the way he turned the key in the lock when he came home in the door. They, she just had learned to associate. And so all the beautiful, tiny little details about being known, and we would say we're known. Now we, we, we might think about how do we know ourselves, that interior dialogue we have with ourselves. Oh, Robbie, why you were... I don't know, I can swear, but you know, you were a bit of a prick then, or that you weren't very kind, or why did that upset you so much? What was it? Or um, what what have I learned? all that dialogue that you have with yourself internally? Do I know myself? Do I not know myself? If you were religious, you might feel that a God knew you. In fact, you would feel that your God knew you. You would feel that your God knew you probably better than anybody else, that there's nothing I can hide from my God. I may be kidding myself, but I can't kid my God. My God will see what's in my heart. He will see if I'm doing something which is ostensibly for noble reasons, for ignoble reasons, that I can't hide. I'm naked before my God. And now we have these new forms of episteme, these new forms, these ways in which we are known out there in data space. And this confluence between navigating that embodiment, our interior dialogue, our social relationships in our families, with ourselves, uh, in our organizations, at state level. What, what does the state know about us? What, what data is it appropriate? What, what, what visibility do we have there? Mm -hmm. The, the way we now as a species navigate, are navigated, are known in data space is one of the key challenges for the 21st century. And I think a lot of organizations will come, maybe come back to states, but a lot of organizations have slept walked into gathering data about their employees which isn't just borderline surveillance. It isn't like, does that look like surveillance? Mm. <laughs> it's they've left it in their rear view mirror. Yeah. When you're talking about semantic analysis of emails, when you're talking about putting trackers on people, when you're talking about looking at the way in which you can see through email patterns in an organization, who sits in the middle of what nodes, you haven't just thought, mm, is this surveillance or not? You are you are as an organization, and I think there's a for a lot of from a governance perspective, for a second, we talk about some hard governance issues. There is a world of pain coming down the pike at boards who have slept walked into the data they gather about people in their organization. So let's take a specific example of a trackpad. We all know that we have an individual signature about an algorithm could say, okay, that's Robbie using his trackpad, that's Demetrius using his trackpad. Okay. And it might be that that's a very good piece of security to say this is a work-issued laptop. I would like to know that it's Robbie using it. And I've built up a pattern about the way Robbie's fingers move across the trackpad. Now, supposing the AI, well, let's push it five years down the road, starts to see early patterns which indicate early onset Parkinson's. So there's now a tremor in the way Robbie uses it. Hmm. Or even back off from that is an interesting tremor the way Robbie uses it when he comes back from lunch, oh. which is indicative of maybe having had a few too many glasses of wine. Yeah. Um, who owns that data? What's your duty of care as an organization? Does your employment contract come even close to managing, being with that kind of inference data? So this theme that you, you wanted to go straight to, which is how are we instantiated in data space? Mm -hmm. How are we held, seen, known in data space? Who has visibility? Who has power over it? What agency do we have? Is one of the big tectonic plate issues for the species that we face in the 21st century. There are many others, but this is one of the big ones. Completely. And I want to dive into the thought about how that would even look if we were able to have all of this information 
at our fingertips on how and who is using our data. I mean, I even, the other day, I, I was looking at all the apps that have access to my Facebook and I got, you know, it was like overwhelming just because there were so many of them. And I was like, ah, whatever, I'm going to do this later. So really, if you wanted to know all the data that is being collected about you and how it's being used, that's a serious time investment. You have to be really, really interested in that. So I just wonder about if the normal person who's going about their day cares that much about it. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting evidence that they don't, yeah. <laughs> but that they say they do. Yeah. Uh, if they're asked in a poll, but actually the way they act, they don't. Now that could be, as I say, because literally the complexities, I, I'm going to not be a million miles away from this, the, 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 the rather good, well, I think it's a very challenging, stimulating book. It was a bit over long, but Shoshana Zuboff's books, are Surveillance Capitalism, mm. she says that, you know, if you were to spend the working hours reading the informed consent notices yeah. that you the consent notices you would be spending something like 70 working days in a year well manifestly none of us are going to do that yeah. which is why thinking about what do we even mean by informed consent so what it means and 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 how it means but if if you think about you know voice recognition algorithms uh so suppose a voice recognition algorithm algorithm uh uh, has a, a form of cultural bias or it's picking up visual cues which says to me and it's looking for lying so that might be something that we know insurance companies are doing uh, you know it's a very helpful thing for them to have a whole bunch of defense against people making fraudulent claims mm -hmm. but the, uh, maybe they're now using some facial recognition technology as well and they've been trained on sometimes you know, some science, which is all right, and sometimes, but there's a lot of cultural difference in the way in which people respond. So, I mean, I have a Finnish colleague who I love, well, don't love, but I'm very fond of him. He's a brilliant guy. But when I talk to him, you can see I'm quite an expressive person. I like to wave my arms around. He's woomph. You're kind of like, oh, my God, he can't wait to finish this conversation. He's hating it. He's, he just can't wait for this to finish. But actually, I get the email that says, Robbie, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. It's great fun to talk to you. And that's because he's giving me nothing. Now, that might not matter unless an algorithm now decides that I'm doing something because of some facial recognition the technology that I'm not. And then maybe it decides I'm angry or I'm lying or I'm a liar. Now, if that happens to start being gathered in a state situation, where maybe it's slightly dangerous hmm. to be to be doing or thinking that thing. Well, the, the, these are very very challenging issues, and so the the underlying validity of the science on which a lot of this is based is maybe questionable. And I I, I first really started thinking about this with a, a colleague who does a lot of work on um, disability at work, and we, we 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 again a simple thought experiment of. Imagine a piece of facial recognition technology that is screening you for coming to a job interview. And the first line is, will I get interviewed by a person or not, is now being done by effectively by an AI. Mm -hmm. And the AI, you are somebody who's had a stroke and half the facial muscles around your, your eye, your left eye, don't work. I was, I was asking somebody who deployed one of these do you know how the algorithm deals with that? Because uh, 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 I assume, here's an assumption, another question for you, is one of the alg things the algorithm is optimized to look for is a certain amount of eye contact. So out of a 10-minute interview, a 15-minute interview, we're one of those companies that likes eye contact. So we're looking for eye contact. And if I don't get 60% of it in a 15-minute interview, that's a, a reject. That's a don't invite this person. So here was my challenge. Unless you can answer that question about how your algorithm is dealing with that, you shouldn't be deploying it into a system where you are now giving it a, a degree of agency and authority over this person. Uh, because you might be missing a brilliant person, but it's just that the algorithm is going, oh my God, something funny happening with the eye there. We like eye contact. We're not having this person. Mm -hmm. So there are some real dangers into how we are known, back to the, the heavier duty foundational thinking about what it means to know and be known. And I think some of the engineering 
magical thinking. And of course, a lot of Silicon Valley engineers would hate me to be accusing them of magical thinking because they're engineers and you, you can know about things. Data will tell you things. But there's an awful lot of fuzziness around these issues, which leave the space for the critical issues around human judgment and decision Completely. making. So along those lines, I think I sent you over an email about this new um, piece of technology that was released. I can't remember the exact name of it, but it is something that Amazon Halo. is releasing right now. Halo. What was it? Halo. Exactly. So it's going to be, the idea is that it's going to be like your health tracker and it can detect things that, you know, early, what we've been talking about, it can detect early onsets of certain kinds of diseases. It will also to detect all of your, uh, your blood pressure, your pulse. And I saw that it said it may even be able to detect the tone of your voice and how you're, if you're angry or if you're not. Uh, and all of this kind of stems back to the idea of, okay, I guess if you're buying one of those, that's just consent in itself. You're saying, yeah, I whatever, Amazon, I trust you with all this data. I prefer the benefit of having something like this than, uh, and you can do whatever you want with the data. But maybe it shouldn't be that like wild, wild west where Amazon just gets free range. They collect all this data. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention was, is there some data that should be mandatory to fork over? Like in this instance of health data, if by collecting it, we can better fight against some of these major, um, for example, a pandemic or other problems that we're having like cancer, if me giving my health data is going to help that, then shouldn't I be obliged to do that in an anonymous way? You don't need to know that it's me. So there's no third party involved, like insurance going up because they see, oh, this person has whatever it is, an early onset of Parkinson's or, or whatever. But if you see that this health data is going to help the greater good, should we be obliged to give that data to um, respective parties? Okay. Well, there are two two questions. Let me try and link them together there. And I'll link them together with, with, with in a way, uh, uh, the, the second question. And then we can work back to the to the the um, the thing about um, individualized health Yeah, data. I just got to let so, you know, I'm notorious for asking many questions at once. So excuse I do it me on that one. I, I, I speak in so many clauses and sub-clauses. It's a besetting sin. I should be old enough now not to do it anymore, but... <laughs> I just do it. Um, the concept of data citizenship is a really is a really important one. That you know, with with rights come obligations as well. So you know, I, I would want to absolutely say that you know I I'm well, but very clear I'm, what I'm not saying, which I'm not saying that this is all bad stuff hmm. by any means. There's an enormous amount, like everything, destructive, constructive. There's there, there, there's, there's nothing in life that isn't like that. You can be constructive you can be destructive so the notion of data citizenship i mean i had cancer several years ago uh and i would be genuinely as a if you're like living in the uk where we have an nhs i contribute to it through my taxes but yes data about you know middle-aged men or anybody getting kidney cancer about my health which might contribute to better treatment better prevention bring it on i would say that as my the fetishization as well of individual data and individual rights mm. is equally a dangerous ultra libertarian position to get to. And, and so I do think that we, we mustn't forget what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be a colleague, what it means to be in a society. So the, sometimes what I feel is the fetishization of individual rights or individual data, I think we need to guard against too. So I think there is indeed a concept of data citizenship, which is not inappropriate to explore. Working backwards to the the data, I actually thought that you know what what Amazon were proposing in terms of 
data and your capacity to rescind data, what they do, you know, you, th th certainly they had, it wasn't just a release that, that you sent me, which was all about, you know, here are all the benefits. There was a, I thought a fairly decent clause about about privacy and about where the data sits and whether you own it now, whether you trust that, whether what happens in reality, we'll wait and see. But clearly they'd thought about it. And again, you know, as somebody, you know, my age, I think a lot about health. And and there's there could be a lot of benefits to me, that quantified self of knowing better how I'm doing, where I might actually, if I did have a little bit of early warning about something. That would be a great thing because, you know, I would like to climb more mountains, yeah. swim. I, I'm a big swimmer. I like long distance swimming. I'd like to do more big swims. I'd like to write poems. There's lots of things I still want to do in my life. And actually to be able to do that with the amount of health and take some responsibility for that and be given more data and back to, a, if you like, an epistemological sense, more data understanding more knowing and that's why so much of this does come back to you know the things that have fascinated humans forever what does it mean to know yeah. what does it mean to be known who knows what what power does knowledge give like so you know you go back to ancient thoughts about my secret name if somebody knows my secret name they'll have power over me yeah. and uh, let, i'm gonna do a little bit of a leg if you'll forgive me to I'll go with you. a thought experiment you and I did the other day yeah. about empathy. Yeah, um, would that be all right if Let's we did it. that that empathy thought experiment? Because it's quite an interesting thought about robots, if you like, mm -hmm. or androids. And I think it's very relevant to drawing together some strands that we've just been talking about. So here's the thought experiment, um, and it encourages you to think deeply when we use words to describe the properties of AI or data what it's what what the ontology is or a favorite word i've only just discovered i don't want to sound the quiddity of something what the essence of something is mm. so here's the experiment and it's about empathy so you imagine you come home to well say 10 years time and there is a an android in the house and your partner and your children aren't there um and it says to you demetrius how's your day and you go oh, no it was a difficult day he says, so what, the meeting with Robbie didn't go well? He said, no. He said, but you'd prepared really hard for me. Yes, yeah, Robbie, it's every time I speak, it was nails down a blackboard. I just, that guy, honestly. And he's, yeah, and, and, and the, the, the AI, the Android, um, let's call it Miffy the Rabbit. Miffy says to you, ah, oh, look, I know, Robbie always gets to you, doesn't he? I could tell. I mean, I could see your cortisol spike. Um, look, I tell you what, Dimitri, go pour yourself a beer, pour yourself a glass of wine, get yourself coffee, come back and tell me about it. And you start, your body starts to feel the hormone release that you would being empathized with. Hmm. Um, and here's the interesting question. If it's also done that Fitbit, Amazon, Halo stuff, so it's done your pulse rate, it's done your heart rate, and it's even more sophisticated. It's doing cortisol, it's doing oxytocin, it's doing serotonin, it's doing a whole bunch of blood markers. It's, it's a really, and it's been doing that for you for years. Yeah. And it recognizes your voice. So it knows when you're under pressure and the facial recognition knows you do something with your hair when you're under pressure. I tend, my family call this rubby eye. This is, this is, you know, they, they my kids notice this very early on. If dad was kind of ready to go to bed or sleepy or something, or sleep, it was rubby eye, I would do this. So it knows all of that about you, knows, interesting, all of that about you. So here's the question. When that thing says to you, mate, go and pour yourself a glass of beer, Go and pour yourself a glass of wine. Are you being empathized with? Is it being empathetic? And does the distinction matter? And that's a fascinating set of questions to unpick because it now in a way knows you in a way which you, if I was to ask you right now, give me a rundown, you might have a sense of your heart rate because there are people who do have that interoception, I think it's called. They have a very high interoceptive sense, mm. but they wouldn't be able to tell me what their current cortisol, testosterone, estrogen levels were in their blood. This thing could. And it may have been doing it for you maybe since, you know, for future humans, since you were born, it's been tracking that. So there's a deep new data epistemology at work there's a relationship with a non-human actor at the moment my answer and at the moment my answer to those three questions are you being empathized with is it being empathetic and does the distinction matter 
is yes, you are being empathised with. No, it is not being empathetic. Hmm. And yes, actually, it does. It is worth thinking about whether or not it matters. Oh, and I think that uh, I, I think this kind of goes to the heart of the theme that you 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 chose for our conversation which is about what does it mean to know and be known? Mm -hmm. What does the new onrush of data capacity to know in different ways? Who has agency over that knowing? How does knowledge erode, shift over time? Exactly. How is it always imperfect, always uh, full of patches and holes? Um, these are... And what does that mean in terms of my relationship with myself as an embodied human, right the way through, if you like, to the species relationship with other complex adaptive systems and beings and species at a planetary level? And every one of those relationships is going to be affected by data, space and AI. Yeah. And it's so much of this data, like you mentioned, is what we do we as humans are not perceiving these things. Even if we are very high sensibility, we don't know how much dopamine is being released in a data level. We know that maybe we feel good or we feel not so good, but this is going to bring a whole new level of sophistication to it and I, I really like that quote that you said, you know, there's constructive and destructive ways that we can use this information. So the question that I guess um, I really would like you maybe to go a little deeper on is some of this data, is it necessary? Are we obliged to give some of our data over if it's for the greater good or is all data collection uh is it all are we free to decide which data is collected and which not okay well i, I, I just want to sort of that finish the last little section of the conversation with as you were just talking at the beginning there about about you know goodness there's so much i, I was reminded for some reason of a of a quotation i've been doing this rather lovely thing of well, I think it's lovely, and my mum does too. I've read her a poem pretty much every day in lockdown. Uh, so since April now, so we're well over 100 poems. And uh, a few weeks ago, I read uh, The Whole of the Four Quartets in consecutive mm. evenings, the T.S. Eliot poem. And there's a great line in there about, you know, humankind not being able to, you know, we can't handle much reality. <laughs> and and I think that, that staring into the face of all of this complexity and all of this data, you're quite right. Overwhelming, powerful, what are we going to do with it? Mm. How are we going to manage it? How do we see it? How do we have any form of agency over it? Uh, and those challenges, in a way, there will be much madness and difficulty. And this is some of this will be very frightening and some of it will be wonderful and it'll show us new vistas and new relationalities and understand the way in which things are connected in ways that maybe we don't see at the moment. Um, so uh, back to, is, the, is there some data that we should? Yes, I actually do think that the concept of data citizenship is an important one in the same way that, you know, I'm if I'm a citizen, I have rights, but I have obligations. And I think that in this new data space, exploring what that means, but then you are straight into how trustworthy exactly. are the institutions, the holders of that information. If somebody, some algorithm has decided somewhere along the line because of some kind of the way it was designed doesn't understand something culturally about the background that has decided this person has liar somewhere on his his data record, a data self. There's 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 somewhere there's a lying thing. Well, do I see it? Do I know it? Can I rescind it? Can I go, no, 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 no. You know, I got it wrong. I wasn't, you know, I didn't set out to say I'd had an accident or, you know, I was... Uh, you know, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I, I've got some things wrong. Yeah. And maybe you detected some stress in my voice because I was stressed because I just had a row because I was frightened about something because I was about to go off to a doctor's appointment, which I was very anxious about. And I was making a call to my insurance company before the doctor's appointment. And I wasn't, well, I wasn't anxious about the insurance call. I was anxious about the test results that I was going to go and have for my doctor. And it wasn't reading any of that context. Mm -hmm. And you can see we could fall into those very dark dystopian spaces where, let's face it, states don't have a great track record 
<laughs> when you fall foul, the whole, you know, Kafka monolithic nature of states, when you fall foul, when you become one of those frightening edge cases where somebody has decided you are a something and you can't get control over it anymore. So th this, this space is a very complex nested one, but do we need to answer your, you know, again, this underlying theme to do a lot more work to address these questions, to think about what forms of agency we can give, you would like, you might like if you chose to. Absolutely, we should. Yeah. We should be doing an awful lot more work about what is the nature of our the nature of our data relationships. What smarter ways could we visualize them so they aren't overwhelming? Um, so you aren't getting, you know, 89 alerts a day going you know, some random company that you've never heard of has, you know, just decided it's going to, going to try and I, I've been looking, I've decided that, you know, I'm, I'm getting an exercise bike. So I will probably now be sold exercise bike adverts by God knows how many people for God knows how long. And I would, I would like some way of going, turn off the exercise bikes already. I've one. made my choice. Yeah, exactly. I've done. Thank you very much. I've made my choice. I don't just that exercise bike ads whatever systems are looking at going middle-aged guy with a couple of pounds to lose looking for exercise bike um i'm done i've made my choice and i'm not going to be good and i'm going to start using it that might be very helpful so technologies which which think about all of the complexity from people will maybe care a lot less than we do until it matters to you until you're finding suddenly you're not getting insured suddenly you know, you you that that the, there are there are things which are happening which are uh, and you know this is before we go anywhere near social credit systems and so on. But you know, I noticed even on that Halo thing, some of the thing about you know the points and point systems, just the idea of a point system for me. Mm. I'm now going to be rated on this hundred yeah. point, and you know, with tone. There's something deeply mechanistic about that. There's something about in in lockdown. I read. Uh, I've read a lot, but I read uh, reread Hard Times, Charles Dickens' Hard Times, which of course starts with that famous scene about facts. Give me facts, and it's all about this: the child of a circus, sissy dupe, sort of um, not wanting to fall into that world of being reduced to numbers on spreadsheets um, and there and tables. And there's Dickens in the 19th century railing against that way of thinking about people, that way of treating. Yeah treating people um and and so we we've got this 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 battle this struggle not to be treated like that not to be reduced to so many data points so many numbers on a spreadsheet uh uh and and it's going to be a struggle and uh uh i don't think anybody has the answers but at least you can start to have these conversations and say yes we need to move towards spaces where there, there are forms of agency and transparency for those who wish it, um, and we absolutely should. And so we're we're getting about time to wrap up. But you said something to me last time we spoke that I would love if you could just explain to us a little more now about being a good ancestor, <laughs> and how that has become your main goal and main objective. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, the first thing to say is that the, the, you know, the whole notion of being a good ancestor is something that is knowledge and wisdom and insight that indigenous peoples all over the world have never lost. Hmm. They've, 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 the, 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 some of the most interesting papers, work that I've read recently has been about situating AI and data within the way that indigenous peoples think from their their concern and anger about the colonization of science and their ways of knowing that have been dismissed by uh, a lot of western science so i'll stick my neck out here and probably get a but you know if you like the the arrogance of ideas emerging from silicon valley like the singularity hmm. which doesn't take into account when they when that's described by white male engineers predominantly is nowhere in their thinking has it taken on other ways of thinking about being in the world? So I want to be very careful to say I have not invented be a good ancestor. 
remotely. Though I did get to register the .com. I was amazed. I was able to register the, the beagoodancestor.com during lockdown. And I'm still working out what's the generous thing to do with it. It seems to me there is, if you like, a big struggle going on in the world. There are many, but here's one way of describing one, which is in the face of all of the complexity that the species currently faces, we've got, if you like, a return to a very, very old way of thinking, which you could summarize by build a wall and blame other people and go back to some kind of mythical golden age when everything was okay. So, and as a response to that complexity, you, you build the wall, you blame other people, enemies within, enemies without, creates a degree of coherence, you hope, in your society. And if you set against everything that stands for, you set against be, build a wall and be a good ancestor. And be a good ancestor is about, I would like to be somebody who sweeps outside my front door. Right the way through to, I would like to be somebody who's thinking about the nature of global multilateral institutions. I think about long-term thinking. What would it mean genuinely to make policy if we were thinking genera generationally? Um, so all of that thinking unto seven generations. What would governments start doing? What would they stop doing? Which voices would they hear? Who would they consult? I, I think governance, I, I've been thinking you can kind of boil it down, always dangerous, to three, three things. Once you've decided on a, on, a, on a trajectory, but this permanent recursive loop, you ask, how's that working for us? Who do we mean by us in any given context? And critically, of whom, and maybe now what in terms of data, are we asking those first two questions? So my little rant about the singularity, which has not asked any of those other voices, any of those other epistemologies, ways of knowing, ways of thinking, what does it mean to subsist in, in, in a world of mycelium networks and, and fungi and lichen and all of these other ways of seeing. Um, and maybe a nice place for me to, to finish is where somewhere I normally start or often start, which is where the, with the late great Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who I was very, very privileged to know well uh, and, and, and was, a, was a close personal friend. Douglas used to tell this great story about a puddle. And he says, there's this puddle wakes up one morning and it looks around at the hole that it's in and it thinks to itself this hole fits me very neatly in fact this hole that i'm in fits me so neatly it must be made especially for me and the puddle believes continues to believe that the hole that it's in was made specially for it as the sun comes up and the puddle evaporates and i think that was douglas's plea for a bit more humility on behalf of sapiens mm in believing we are necessarily the apogee of cognition, perception, and intelligence, uh, as opposed to one wonderful, messy, fabulous, contradictory, frustrating, infuriating, gorgeous, lovable, wonderful expression of it. But what Douglas wanted to do was to open your eyes to other perspectives, other ways of being, other systems we share this planet and this galaxy with. And I think being a good ancestor stewardship what does it mean to be a good steward um is a is it we can set that narrative that simple narrative build a wall be a good ancestor and i think that the kind of communities that we work in and that doesn't mean it's all you know liberal fantasy just a left-wing fantasy there are lots and lots of different perspectives that should be in that those very broad boundaries but i think it's a very powerful way of starting to think about cohering everybody who wants to start thinking differently about the nature of capitalism, about inclusivity, about Black Lives Matter, about the colonization of science. All of those things, I think, can be summed up. But we need those narratives because they need to be powerful enough to be able to deal with the power, the brute power of build a wall and blame other people. Yeah. Perfect. Well, this has been wonderful, Robbie. I really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening and watching me wave my arms around. I'm very grateful. <laughs> I love it. That's the best part. The arm waving is, uh, is incredible. <laughs> it shows the passion that is there. And I could talk with you for many more hours as we have done before. This is just wonderful 
speaking about these things need to come to the forefront this all of this that we're talking about it needs to be spoken about more we need to as a collective society look at it and grapple with these ideas that don't necessarily have a clear-cut answer to them so i think it's very important for people like yourselves to be out there doing what you're doing and bringing this to the masses, we could say, and letting. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to talk. It's been a great, it's been a great pleasure and a real honor. And it's, it's I, I do care about these things. They they matter a great deal. And I just want to be, I just want to make that tiny little contribution, yeah. just to try and nudge that dial towards the constructive. There it is, with, with an awareness of all the messiness and contradictions that are in myself too. So, last question: mm. Are you a robot? <laughs> I hope not. No, no, I don't think so. I, I am somebody, <laughs> probably says more information than either you or your listeners want. In the bath this morning, I was reading an essay about free will <laughs> and about, 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 about determinism and free will. I am, I am absolutely currently on the side that we have free will, mm. uh, that, that although the physical systems, which have uh, probability, they are the enablers for choices that we do make. And I'm not somebody who believes we have no free will. Um, maybe a whole other podcast actually is about exploring more deeply what the ontology of AI and data and consciousness and intelligence might look like. But no, I think for now, I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm not a robot because I've, I've, I've walked under in, you know, well, the, I suppose the great um, Rutger Hauer speech in uh, Blade Runner, um, but you know the all all the, the sensory making. So I'll tell you what. I if you've got two minutes, I'm going to read you something yes. that I I decided to keep a a diary of liminal the, the liminal thoughts that I have um, um, when I wake. Mm. And the other morning, this line of 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 poetry came fully formed to me. Um, and it's very strange in, the, in, in the, the early hours. And it was this strange thing. After seeing the face of a horse with tattered cloth and bandages and strips of rough material, mm -hmm. I heard this phrase, with a small cocoon length, roaring and burning into the world. And all of my sense of human embodiment and memory are so deeply based on my chemical substrate evolution are over 3.8 billion years that there are things that i do and feel that i suspect no robot ever will but that's not to say that there may well be other forms of instantiation which have similarities and i think this is a as i say i'm going off down a whole other rabbit hole which we probably ought to stop but i think this is philosophically deeply deeply interesting and douglas talked about Mar marvin the paranoid android so here's a thought would would us our listeners ever want paranoid ai jokes aside would you ever want ai which felt out of control persecuted think about all those moments in one's own life where one's felt out of control, mm. would you ever want AI to be feeling that? And those are those are big other questions, but probably for another day. Exactly. So anyway, there's your thought experiment. Would you ever want paranoid AI for real? Wow. Yeah, that's a great way to leave it. And if anyone wants to reach out and connect with you, continue the conversation, what's the best way to talk? You can you? find me at Twitter at Robbie Stamp 42. Um and um uh, yeah that's probably the easiest that's probably uh, twitter's probably Perfect. the easiest we'll and i'm fairly easy to find on the web the bios.com website's got my email i'm always happy to hear from people excellent ravi thank you so much and thank you everybody to listen for listening we'll see you later thank you take care bye for now